What's going on everybody? It's your boy Naruto Explain here and today we have some breaking news to discuss in the world of Naruto and it's a topic I get the feeling that it was something we were going to be discussing last year when I heard chatters of things heating up regarding the Naruto movie and development but now we've moved from chatters this being in development in a major way that needs to be covered which yes there is a Naruto movie in development but it's not a movie done by Studio Piro but instead this is done by Lionsgate which for those of you guys who are unaware that is a movie studio that specializes in live action movies. Now look I'm not going to come here. I'm not going to dump on the movie that's not out yet like a lot of ill-informed people are doing that jump the gun. However, I'm also not going to come out here and praise the movie that's not out yet. As you guys know by now, I'm just going to report the news with the source. I'm going to give my thoughts, but this is a special case. It's going to be a longer video than normal because I have a very informed opinion on this, especially when it comes to the director, which I have no problems with, and the producer, which if you guys have followed me on Twitter for the last four years, then you know that I am not not a big fan of the producer that is handling this movie. I would love to be proven wrong. I hope I'm proven wrong. For all intents and purposes, it's going to be my pipe bomb moment, which if you're a WWE fan, you get that reference. If you don't, you're about to learn. There are bright spots to this whole live action Naruto movie thing, and I do think it's important to start there before I go into my pipe bomb. I'm not one of these people who are going to be saying that you cannot adapt manga into movie because being blunt, if you're saying that you're stupid. It's printed media with pictures, just like comic books. Just like how comic book movies needed several years before we started getting consistent quality. Yes, you had exceptions to the rule where there were good comic book movies, but on average, you had a lot of stinkers. Manga being adapted into live action, it's gone a similar route, but I'll go into detail on that later. But for now, I'm throwing that out there for transparency's sake. So with bright spot number one, the Naruto series creator Masashi Kishimoto is deeply involved with this project. So right off the bat, this isn't a Dragon Ball Evolution situation where there are still people who have PTSD from that experience. Fox messed that movie up so bad that it led to Toriyama revising the script for Battle of Gods, an animated movie, and it led to the birth of Dragon Ball Super. Kishimoto is taking the approach that Nobuhiro Watsuki and Etro Oda did with their manga series that got adapted into live action. Watsuki was deeply involved in the five Rurouni Kenshin movies where where he was not only on set for the production, but he literally wrote half the script on each of those five films and oversaw extensive revisions on the second half of each of those five film scripts, which is why those movies did extremely well in Japan. And for full transparency, I have those five films on physical media. Those films are considered the godfather of live action shown in for a reason. Those films are what led to Waski's former assistant and pupil, Etro Oda, the One Piece mangaka, taking a similar hands-on approach in the One Piece live action that we saw on Netflix last year. So that's good news in that sense. Kishimoto is taking a similar approach. He picked the director for this project and I am a huge fan of the director. Destin Credden is a damn good director who has range as a director and the common theme that you see with this movies is that they are very character driven movies which is what you want with a live action Naruto because Naruto as a series is a very character driven story. If you've seen movies like Just Mercy or The Shack, then you know the range that I'm talking about. And you know what I mean when I say he's a character-driven director. Most famously, he directed Shang-Chi, the Marvel Phase 4 film. And up until recently, he was slated to direct the fifth Avengers movie, Kang Dynasty, though due to some restructuring and rewriting that Disney is doing that leaves it open to change and that 2026 release date is in danger if they don't begin filming this fall because you have post-production to worry about. So you have a big name director on the Naruto franchise for that movie. Shang-Chi is one of the gems that Marvel had for Phase 4. For all of the stinkers Marvel Phase 4 has had, Shang-Chi was a bright spot from the way that the choreography was done to the attention paid onto the characters in the script itself to how the world building was handled in that story, which he walked a very fine line of telling a story that went back for several years in time to also expanding into parallel worlds and planting more seeds for more expansion for a larger story that was bringing in characters from other dimensions like iron fist which again for a story as big as naruto is that's exactly what you want masashi kishimoto absolutely picked the right director for this now it's time you have to clear up something before we go into the issues I have with the live action Naruto movie. You're gonna have people that are making the mistake and I've seen plenty of people doing it of how are they gonna do Madara and what about the Susano and how are you gonna do Kage in live action? How are you gonna have Naruto using the KCM cloak? 
that's not gonna look good. So being blunt, that's stupid. You're not adapting the end of the story for the first movie. Hollywood has come a long way since adapting Dragon Ball Evolution. The Alita movie, director Pikachu, the Sonic movies, Hollywood has come a long way when it comes to adapting video games as well as manga. Those are movies that did not drop the ball. You're not gonna be getting all that war stuff right away. A 90 to 120 minute film is likely only covering the first couple arcs of the story in a condensed manner. This is not going to be a one-to-one -one retelling of the story. You are likely going to be taking a page out of the Roni Kenshin movies. The live action Kenshin movie took the first major arc of the story, the Tokyo arc, which is 47 chapters in the manga, and under the guidance of Nobuhiro Waski, the manga author, they told a condensed version of that story, hitting all the major story elements, combining other elements, cutting out some elements, and making changes to the live action script to give longtime fans such as myself something new to experience while also giving new fans a reason to check out the material. One Piece did something similar. If you've read the One Piece manga or if you've watched the anime, you know that there are major changes made to that One Piece live action like Garp showing up in the way that he did, Arlong and Buggy working together and etc. It was all done in a way that hits the main story points while also giving a new take on the story and creating interest with new fans like my brother-in-law who were hesitant to try out One Piece because of the length and he ended up getting into the series he's currently in Dressrosa right now and it's because of the live action. You're likely going to be telling the story of the Land of Waves arc which is around 40 chapters in manga format. You are likely going to be having changes made because again a movie adaptation is not a one-to-one -one retelling it's why say in high school middle school whatever your teacher tells you before you do a book report don't watch the movie because the movie almost always takes liberties with the story and changes things i can tell within five minutes of talking to someone if they've read the harry potter books or the percy jackson books or if they've only watched the movie version for those stories the same with comic book fans i can tell if somebody is an mcu fan or if there's someone who's read the comics because thanos from the comics particularly the thanos from the infinity war comics is not the same as the thanos that you had in the mcu so again you're going to have changes made to this naruto story if the roni kenshin five movies weren't immune from it if one piece wasn't immune from it neither will the naruto movie even the Japanese version of the Death Note story, not that nonsense you saw on Netflix, we just pretend that never happened, but the Japanese TV series that aired in 2015, it was well done, it ran for 11 episodes, and while it was well received, it still made changes to the story. Manga has been moving out of that dark ages into live action for a while now, and the common theme that you see is that the ones that went over very well, they tended to have certain things in place. They had a scriptwriter and a director and a producer who knew the material, they respected the material, or you had the mangaka involved in the production, or like the five Kenshin films and the One Piece live action season one, you had a combination of all of those things. With the Naruto movie, even if say you go for a fast pace and you blend the first two arcs together, you're not gonna have a ton of CGI and special effects need to be done. The most you're gonna be breaking the budget out for is when Naruto goes into his rage and he snaps on Haku and a few moments with the Kakashi versus Zabuza fight and Haku using ice release. In all honesty, that's why I think Shang-Chi having that director is perfect for it. You're likely going to have a similar amount of CGI, potentially less given the material. And if Lionsgate is smart and they shoot in places like Atlanta, they can spend a whole lot of money on the budget for the film because places like Atlanta will eat a lot of that budget because of all the tax breaks that are given. Atlanta, New Zealand, Australia, whatever place you want to go to, they'll eat a lot of the cost, which means you can build a more exquisite set or you can take more risks that you normally wouldn't do because you're not being budget conscious. However, this is where I have my pipe bomb moment. This is where you see a different side to Naruto to explain, but due to YouTube's monetization rules, I'm not gonna be swearing the way I want to. Ever since I found out in 2020 that Abby Arad was the producer, my hopes for a Naruto live action movie, they plummeted. They're not in the toilet, but they definitely plummeted. The problem with Abby Arad, or Crazy Uncle Abby, as I will continuously call him in this video, is if you do a quick Google search of his name and you get on the computer and the computer's computing, you go, oh wow, this guy, he's done some really big comments comic book movies, he's done blockbuster movies, this is gonna be amazing. And that's where the problem lies. In this era of 60 second shorts, 90 second TikToks, the attention span that people have of wanting a quick answer is gonna lead to some deception. Yes, 
he has producer credits. And in Hollywood, you have people who get producer credits without them being highly involved in the project. Titles, they get thrown around. Akira Toyama most famously was a creative consultant for Dragon Ball Evolution. And we will learn years later that it was a nightmare for him and he was isolated from the project and disgusted with the project. So why does Avi Arad concern me? I have valid reasons and I'm gonna run through them very detailed before I close out the video with the issue for the politics behind the movie rights for live action nards are being a concern for me. I have no problems with Lionsgate as a studio. They've done movies that I enjoy. And I think when Avi Arad stays out the kitchen and lets the cooks actually cook, he's a great producer. However, here's the thing. The live action movie rights is something that needs to be addressed because fans, unless you're super hardcore fans like me, where you read and you do research of all the behind the scenes stuff that deals with the movies, you likely haven't even thought about the rights being an issue. Hell, I guess if say 20,000 of you guys watch this video, 5,000 of you probably don't even know that there was a Naruto movie in production until yesterday when the Hollywood Reporter broke the news that Kishimoto picked the director and that statement was made in the Variety and Hollywood Reporter articles and everything went viral on Twitter. So crazy Uncle Avi, why am I so worried about crazy Uncle Avi? It's because with comic book films, we've seen him be that guy who goes into the kitchen at the last minute and starts cooking up changes where changes don't need to be made. People say, well, what about the first Spider-Man trilogy? Thought that aged very well. People love that. Well, here's the thing. He kept his ass out the kitchen for the first two films. And when the third film, that's when he started poking around. And while we have revisionist history now, where everybody loves the third movie, back when that movie first came out, anyone old enough to remember, such as myself, they remember the film reception that it got when it first came out and it was dunked on because it was all over the place. And it was because Crazy Uncle Abby came in and said, Hey, Sam Raimi, I know you took some extra time to come up with this script. I don't care about that story you're telling with Spider-Man and Sandman and Uncle Ben. I don't care about Harry Osborn being the goblin in this movie. You know, things that were being set up as far back as the first film. He comes in and says, hey, this film, you know what it needs more of? It needs more Venom. Now, why would he do that? Well, Venom was a super popular character. Venom sold a lot of toys. Crazy Uncle Abby is a producer and the movie studio got some of the merchandise and profits based off of merchandise created and sold around the movie. That's why the Venom character and the symbiote stuff, that was all stuff that felt like it was a movie within a movie for the third movie of Spider-Man because well, it was. Crazy Uncle Avi and the producers at Sony, they had plans back then for a Venom spinoff movie, and they realized, hey, we're not only in the production of a third Spider-Man movie that had no foreshadowing whatsoever for Venom in any of the movies prior to this, and they had no plans to use Venom for Spider-Man 3. And at that point, Sam Raimi already had ideas for the fourth Spider-Man movie to use Vulture and Mysterio as a small-time villain, and to use Black Cat, but Crazy Uncle Abby said, wait a second, we have no Venom. So it might be the fifth film before we even have Venom involved with Spider-Man, which led to him storming in and saying, Spider-Man 3 needs more Venom, make it happen. We wanna do a Venom movie. So we need Spider-Man in this. Now you might be going, wait a second, the Venom movie didn't come out until the 2010s. We'll get to that in a moment. Now the amazing Spider-Man 2, it suffered the same fate and it almost killed the Spider-Man IP because Crazy Uncle Avi, he swoops in and goes Sinister Six. We need more Sinister Six in this, and we need to have the Goblin in this film as well, even though Mark Webb's team built the story around Electro, a very Electro-centric movie. That's how the film suddenly gets revived to having Electro as a villain, but then you also have the Sinister Six being built up in the background, and then you have the Green Goblin being introduced, and you have the death of Gwen Stacy, one of the most iconic Spider-Man storylines in history. A huge storyline for Peter Parker, which the first movie was clearly setting up as being part of a trilogy. All of a sudden, all that stuff gets crammed into the second movie, and on the cutting room floor, we had Mary Jane Watson introduced into the film with extensive scenes on top of that. Because crazy Uncle Avi went into the kitchen at the 11th hour, started demanding changes, and it's all because he had dollar signs in his eyes. And MCU Spider-Man, the boy who everyone calls Iron Boy Jr., even though MCU is Disney Spider-Man, 
Well, he isn't even immune from Crazy Uncle Abby as well. Ever wonder why Uncle Ben is an afterthought in the MCU? It isn't just because they wanted to not fall into the trap of retelling the same stuff over and over. That was part of it. But Crazy Uncle Abby is the one that put his foot down. Spider-Man Homecoming and that huge thing with the cruise ship boat thingy. It wasn't supposed to be just Tony Stark who came in there. We have the concept art. It shows us that it was Iron Man and War Machine and Vision stepping in with Spider-Man, presenting him in a better light because of things going on with Avengers Tower, but crazy Uncle Abby said, hey, that's gotta go. Make Peter be the screw up for the scene, which I can agree with to an extent, but the reason he took that stance is, hey, we're paying Robert Downey Jr. so much money. So let's cut this Captain America scene that was supposed to be more than just Steve Rogers cutting a corny Cody Rhodes style Mr. Rogers videotape saying, hey, you got in trouble in school, did you? Well, gee whiz, shucks, golly whiz. All the constant Tony Stark, I see his face everywhere I look stuff. They got crammed into Far From Home and Tony Stark saving the day at times in Homecoming. Crazy Uncle Abby wanted to play up more around Tony Stark and use this image because he went, well, we already paid Robert Downey Jr. millions of dollars for the first film, and he's getting a certain percentage of the box office on top of that. We need to stretch that money as far as we can go. Spider-Man No Way Home was amazing, largely because of the nostalgia factor it gave you, but the original plans for the third Spider-Man movie were to use Kraven, which explains the whole wanted for murder thing at the end of Spider-Man Far From Home. But part of the deal that Disney and Sony came up with for the new Spider-Man agreement we have, which is nearing its end, that led to that being scrapped, which, oh boy, we're gonna touch on Kraven later because they're about to butcher Kraven. Crazy Uncle Abby is the reason behind the laundry list of issues that the 2000s failures that were the Fantastic Four movies and my personal favorite failure, X-Men The Last Stand. Crazy Uncle Abby got into the kitchen and instead of cooking, he turned the story that had the bones to be a proper third X-Men installment and he cooked up poison that left the film so poorly received that it led to a reboot of one of the biggest franchises at Hollywood at the time. Crazy Uncle Abby even admitted years ago when the first Venom movie was starting to come out that, hey, I know I messed up. So yeah, I'm not going to bash the guy because it takes a big man to admit when they've gotten too big of an ego and they've overstepped because he bought into his own hype of he was the godfather, the kingpin of Hollywood comic book movies. And over the course of the next few years, the guy that he didn't listen to ended up becoming the face of production for Hollywood comic book movies, Kevin Feige and Avi Arad took a step back. Life does that to you sometimes. I give flowers where they're due across the Spider-Verse. He was a producer on that. And he's the one who made the right call with the team. If you're gonna do this multiverse film, having the spot as the villain for Spider Across the Spider-Verse, this makes the most sense. And Across the Spider-Verse might honestly be the best comic book film ever in my opinion. However, since we're talking recency bias here, we can't mention Crazy Uncle Abby and give him his flowers without also mentioning the modern day cluster Fs that he had his fingerprints all over, like Morbius, the movie that made a hundred million trillion more billion bucks the movie responsible for all the memes of his morbing time he's the guy who had the bright idea of let's make a craven's the hunters movie let's adapt craven's last hunt but let's make it craven's origin story and let's not have anything to do with spider-man in if you played the new spider-man game you know how much potential there is with craven as a character the uncharted movie while i personally don't mind it i never played the game so i am one of those casual normies that the movie appealed to the people i do know like my buddy six pass who played the game they dislike the film but that was a commercial success and that's likely going to be a big franchise moving forward for sony who right now is in danger of becoming the next 20th century fox and getting sold off in the future by the end of this decade book market by the end of this decade sony is in danger of being sold good old crazy uncle abby the guy who rushes in and causes productions to be rushed at the last minute because of changes that he forces on the directors and writers. You wanna get more insight onto this, as well as a deeper explanation on why the movie rights should be something that you have in the back of your mind. Lionsgate or whatever company has like the rights to Naruto or whatever live action manga series in the future, this is gonna be important. The book MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, which is a very fantastic read. Kevin Feige talks about how 
movie studios have producers that will rush out a project before it's ready because they have to do something with the rights to the movie characters before they lose them, which ultimately cheats the fans, which is why he reveals that he had a sit down with crazy Uncle Abby and said, hey, Captain America is about to go to Warner Brothers. Stop that sale and give him to Marvel Studios. I have a long-term plan. The live action rights to Dragon Ball, they were about to expire. So Fox, who sat on those rights for a decade, give or take a year or two, they rushed that film out before it was ready. The stinker that was the Daredevil movie, which the director's cut is really good, by the way, and should have been the film that we got. That got rushed out for the same reason. Fox was about to lose those rights. Same with Fantastic Four, the 2000s movies. Sony has to put out something Spider-Man related every so many years, which is why we have pieces of dog crap like Madam Web and Morbius, because otherwise they lose the rights to those characters. I'm more interested in Cody Rhodes finishing his story than I am of watching either of those films. And God help me because I am a glutton for punishment. I saw the films and I want my money back. As the book details, while Crazy Uncle Abby did do Kevin Feige a solid and got character rights and brokered deals with Universal to share the rights for characters like the Hulk, Crazy Uncle Abby wanted a stranglehold on all things Spider-Man, Marvel's biggest character, and almost single-handedly destroyed the Spider-Man brand, which is why Amy Pascal and other execs pushed to get Spider-Man involved with the MCU because there should never be a world where Tasm 2 does so much damage to the character that that franchise begins to start affecting other aspects of Spider-Man like we started seeing in 2013 to 2016. And I have to explain all that because Avi has connected himself so much to the stuff with Spider-Man that you can't really talk about him as a producer without talking about the failures of the Spider-Man live action, which some of those decisions that were made came down to keeping movie rights, which is what we're talking about here. Studio politics often gets in the way of what directors and writers wanna do, what other producers on a film want to do, and that's a concern that I do have with the Naruto IP, just based off of past behavior. Just as Kevin Feige tried to convince Crazy Uncle Avi and other execs, hey, a shared universe where X-Men and Spider-Man cross over with the Avengers, it can make over a billion dollars. Sony and Fox, which Crazy Uncle Avi was sitting at the table, both of them shut that down. Hence the Nick Fury line at the end of Iron Man 1 about mutants, and a guy swinging with webs, it was cut out, and we never saw Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man crossover. I worry that despite Kishimoto picking an excellent director, one of my favorite directors, and an amazing writer, and Kishimoto being as involved as he is with this project, I do worry it might be a little bit too late because it's coming up on a decade since the Lionsgate deal got the rights, but we don't know how long those movie rights are for. It could be a 15-year deal, it could be a 20-year deal, that's the case, nothing to worry about. If this is something where the rights are gonna be up relatively soon and the movie has to get produced and put out within the next two years, I would be worried. Again, I would love to be wrong, and particularly when it comes to the person that is producing this because they've had moments of brilliance. And I am hoping that Kishimoto being the one that picked the director and given the director the right to write the movie and Kishimoto being involved means that this is gonna be more in line with Kenshin and with One Piece. I hope I am right in that regard. <laughs>